way not. Okay, I'll, I'll start with a simple one. Yeah. Arizal, the Arizal, Marami Prague versus Rashi. Which of the two belong in the same generation? Not exactly, but close. Arizal, Marami Prague, Rashi. Was Rashi closer to the Arizal than the Marami Prague, or Rashi closer to them? So you would say Marami Prague and Arizal, and of course, Rashi many hundreds of years before. Arizal and Rashi lived about 500 years ago. Maral lived, Arizal passed away at the age of 38. Maral lived in, in, deep into his 90s. He was born, I believe, before the Arizal, but passed away many years after, of course. Um, and he was in Prague, the Arizal was in Tzfat. Name me two other tzaddikim that daven in the same shul of the Arizal. Yosef Karo is one. He was a, Yosef Karo was the rabbi, the Arizal was the rabbi. He was a third great, great person. Yeah. No, when she put it there was the Arizal's teacher. Ramak. Cordova, Cordovero. The answer is Sha'al Shif. He wrote a safer on Khumish and on Tanakh with 50, 60 questions, and then he gives one answer and ties them all together. So Ramesha al Shish is the one who, he was the speaker. He was the rabbi who gave the drafta. The Arizal was the rabbi, the Beis Yosef, he was the posseg. He didn't speak. Those days, rabbis were not talkers. And they had a special person who gave the drafta. Okay. Who is the rabbi? Okay. Third one besides, so we have the Arizal, the Beis Yosef, and the al Shish. A-L-S-H-I-C-H, al Shish. The Moshe al Shish is anyway. Um, who was before? Rambam, Maimonides, or Nachmanides? What? No, Rambam and Ramban. Maimonides or Nachmanides? Who lived before? Huh? No. Rambam was about 70 years before the Ramban. Ramban, although he does argue with the Rambam, boy, does he take up for the Rambam. Wasn't he his like, grandson or something? No, 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 not related. Ramban is a chassid of the Rambam, although he argues with him in several places, a lot of places. But the Ramban loved the Rambam. He said, anyone who dares question the validity, there was a lot of questions in those days about the Rambam's authenticity. Ramban writes, whew, like, like the biggest chassid you could ever imagine or whatever. The rivet about Ram Ben David were three rivets. So Bavram ben David, the third one, was the one that was always, always. But in the Ram, you look up, up in the Ram, you'll see Rabbi Avram has his uh, disagreements with the Rambam. And sometimes he's very, very sharp. Not that he didn't think the Rambam was authentic. He just has a lot of, I mean, very strong words against the Rambam. Did you say pen? Sorry. Did I take your pen? Yeah, did you or? I could be because I'm a little senile. Okay, but, so then I'll take you might right? take that. You, this, can, yeah. There's something missing here. This class is missing here. Okay, so I'm going to take that. I'm going to remember. Okay, so that's that. So right. what they're saying. Oh, well, oh. So, so the Ravid in a few places says to the about the Rambam. How dare you say this about Eliezer, Evan Avram? The Rambam wants to give uh, Eliezer. Who gave signs which girl is the right girl to marry? You know, for Yitzchok, and she he gave. If it's this, the girl comes and he and she and she asked me, please, uh, let me let me uh, get you give your camels a drink. That's the girl. The Ramam calls that something that's illegal to do. So the rabbit says, "What? How dare you say that about Eliezer Eben Avram? If he would be around, he would shoot sixty rods of fire against you." <laughs> it's a story only. Other places he says, "These words are words of are foolish words." Or an even stronger language sometimes. But it doesn't mean that he felt the Rambam is not authentic. But he was a very, a very strong opponent of the Rambam in Halacha. Not as a person, but was authentic and great. That's the Raivin. The Raivin was a contemporary of the Rambam, lived exactly the same time as the Rambam. The Rambam lived about 70 years later. How about the Rambam versus Tosvos? Rabbeinu Tam, Rashbam, the Balga Tosvos were Rashi's grandsons. Are they before the Rambam? Yes, one generation before. The Rambam is 
But there's a Rambam mentioned twice, I think, in Shas from Tosfos. Tosfos brings Rabbeinu, Moshe, and Maimon Hasfardi. Very, 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 very scarce. He brings it, I think, twice in the entire Talmud. One, I think Brachos is one of them, and another place. There's one. Rashi's grandson. Rashi's grandson sons were Rabbeinu Tam. He was the greatest of Rashi's grandchildren. Uh, they say all the other grandchildren of Rashi were like onion peels compared to the depth of the brain of Rabbeinu Tam. <laughs> Rabbeinu Tam said, "Whatever Rashi, whatever Rashi did in Gemara, I can I can emulate." But what my grandfather did in Chumash, that's impossible. The Rambam never met Rashi, of course, because they didn't live in the same generation. The Rambam was three generations later, about 90 years after. But he saw, he was thinking of making a Peter from Chumash. When he saw, that's what I heard, when he saw the Peter's Rashi, somehow got to him, he went, whoa, 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 did a good job. But the Rambam never saw Rashi. So anyone thinks that they're, they interacted, it's wrong. Okay. Is that why a lot of the same thing even though you know sometimes they'll say the same thing without even if they do know each other they don't have to quote, quote each other they don't have to necessarily quote each other okay um Gemara. I want to go back to the Gemara, which we started last Friday, and I want to continue. There's a story that I'd like to go through, if possible, today as well. In the Gemara, the Shana, it's Daf Yud Zayin, Daf Tezayin. I'm I'm sorry, Tezayin. Oh, I wanted to share with you a Chiddush uh, shot in the Gemara. The Gemara asks a very strange question: Why do we blow? Why do we blow? Because the Torah says so. Duh. No, no, I meant why do we blow a trua? That one. Why do you blow a trua? The Torah says so. Then the Gemara says, no, no, no. I mean, why do we blow twice? Once before Shmon Esrei, once in Shmon Esrei. Oh. Then the Gemara answers to confuse us up. What was the nature of the first two questions? So a chasidish shot would be like this. Well, the Gemara was asking something much deeper. The Gemara didn't say, where is the source? Where is the source? That would be minalon, minayin, from whence? Where do you know that we have to blow? The Gemara didn't ask, where do we know? It asked, why? Now, what's the question, why? What's so terrible about blowing? What, what, why is it so strange? Gemara, so here's the answer. A tekiah is a sound of joy. A truah is a sound of brokenheartedness. A tekiah is a cry, but it can also be a cry of joy. Yay! Hooray! Simcha! Bitochon! A trua. But here's the question. How can we, from where, why in the world should we be able to be so joyous and so sure that things will work out this year, that we'll have a good, sweet year? Why do we get dressed and we wear Shabbos clothing? We should be, we should be in, in, in awe and not feel so reassured. Can't this happiness, this joy, leave us astray? That's the Gemara's question. I'll be say this. And the Gemara's answer is the Torah. It says in the Torah. The Torah gives us, one second, the Torah gives us the strength to be able to not allow the joy to cause frivolity. Frivolousness comes sometimes when the joy is not based on Torah. If the Torah mandated joy, it's not going to lead to becoming frivolous. So don't worry about it. We guess we can have the Bitachin and Hashem be very happy. On Rosh Hashanah, and it's not against the atmosphere of Rosh Hashanah at all. Okay, then why in the world do we suddenly blow a trua, which is brokenheartedness? Can't that lead to depression? Again, the Gemara's answer is Torah will safeguard that brokenheartedness will not lead to depression. Just as joy will not lead to, fr to frivolity, if it's written in the Torah to be brokenhearted, it's a good thing. It won't cause you to fall and become depressed. Torah is the refuah. It makes sure that all the feelings that you're supposed to have for Rosh Hashanah will not pull you in either direction. And Torah includes all different kinds of feelings. So if you follow the Torah, we could have a bitachon, then brokenheartedness, and then again bitachon. Tikiya, trua, tikiya. First, we have bitachon. Then we, Hashem wants us to be brokenhearted. And then, 
we feel at the end we ask another tkiya. The other tkiya is a sound of joy that we were successful. Okay. Let's see the Gemara inside now. So we're up to 16b1. On the bottom of the left column, a fourth teaching. You don't judge a person based on what he will be. Hashem knows the future. Hashem does not judge a person based on what's going to happen to him, what, go, what that person will do, even though he knows that person will do a lot of terrible things. A person is only is judged according to their present state. Only the, for his actions at that moment, i.e., even though God knows he will act wickedly in the future, God judges him as for his actions as of the present time. How do we know this? You smile. This is the, the laying of the Torah on Rosh Hashanah. Dying of thirst. She started crying. Hagar started crying. That her son is dying. She put him down. She couldn't look at him anymore. She was afraid to even watch his death. So Hashem says, why are you crying? I've heard the sound of the baby, of the, of the young child. Yishamalakim, not a baby, but he was a young child. Kol hanar asher l'sham. I have heard, he did his cry of the youth based on where he is now. But asher l'sham means based on his present state. Yeah, later on he's going to mess up. But right now he's still innocent. So based on his innocence, now I will not judge him and I will save him. The question that's asked is, is this is contradiction to the story with the rebellious child. The rebellious child didn't do something so seriously. All he did was steal some meat. Okay, it's not a big, it's a, it's a sin, but to put him to death. By the way, this never happened. Don't worry about it. It's never happened, never will happen. One of the things that are mentioned in Chumash and it's not going to ever happen and it has not happened. So there's so many conditions that it's impossible for it to fit. But, but the Torah says, let's not wait till Imam kills people. Let's get him now. But I thought we don't uh, punish a person based on his future. So that seems to go against this Gemara over here. And there are many, and one, one answer that's given is, depends. Who's judging you, God or the basin? If it's the basin down here, then they also judge by based on your future. If it's God who judges, God judges only what you're doing right now. So in Chumash, with Ishmael, we're talking about God. In the story with the rebellious trial, it's not about Hashem, it's about the courts down here. They do have the job to make sure the person doesn't do any greater sins, and then he'll really be in trouble, so we take his life away early. But again, that's only hypothetical. It never happens, never will happen. Further, There are three things that that a person sins and it becomes it, three things that a person might do that recalls the heavenly you're calling for trouble you're awakening a prosecution against yourself by doing three things you're asking for it what are the three things the elohim kirin notary passing beneath a leaning wall or any kind of dangerous situation going through a danger where you need hashem salvation to help you ah, i'm okay i'm not worried about it be worried because even if you get rescued from it and nothing happens to you, your merits will be eaten up. The fact that Hashem uh, made a miracle for you or helped you and you didn't deserve it is never a good thing. But number two, they always say, wait a second, why is this person so sure of himself? It must be so good. Let's check his, let's check his, uh, you know, his itinerary. And they find out you're not so, you're asking for it. You're asking for God to become, uh, you know, to really test you. And that's not a good thing. But don't ever walk in dangerous places. The Iyun Tfila, expecting one's prayer to be fulfilled. Iyun Tfila means you look in, that was a good dominant. I did a very, very good job. I've never had so much Kavana. I'm sure I'm going to get a lot, a very positive response. Don't ever say that to yourself. What you should say is, I have Bitachim, that Hashem's kindness will, me notwithstanding. Yeah, but if you say, wow. <laughs> He can't say no to that. I poured, I was crying half, you know, for half an hour. I for three hours this morning. 
how would God, God dare not give me a, you know, a, 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 a brother in return? That's one thing you're asking for. Don't ever do that. Number three, submitting judgment on one's, fe on one's fellow to heaven. If a person dives to Hashem, please, Hashem, punish this person. He's driving me crazy. Can you please punish him? And you have recourse. You can go to a, you can go to a basin. There's other ways of getting back, of, of, of you know, eliminating your suffering. And instead of going to a court, to a rabbi, to take care of things, you go straight to Hashem. Hashem, take my case. I should take your case. Who are you, by the way? Let's see how perfect you are. And you get Hashem to start scrutinizing every little thing you didn't do right in your life. So don't do that. By the way, even tefillah could mean two other things. Gemara says, here it means looking in, delving into how good your tefillah was. That's the bad thing. Because whenever even tefillah is, diving without on altogether. That's not dangerous. That's just not good. And it says one of the three things that everyone, one day or another, fails in is davening with kavana. We always, one time or another, miss. Gemara even tells us of great sages who also said, I also uh, missed out a few things here and there. Of course, on a different level. Completely. So that's that. Then there's a third type of eon fila is where you, eon means to, on the contrary, you delve into your davening and you daven with great kavana, not expecting anything in return. Davening and you put your whole focus on your davening. That's a great, so we have a great one, a not good one, and a really bad one. Ewan Tfilo, the good side means you look into your, into the words you're davening and you delve deep into it. The middle one is the opposite. I fail in Ewan Tfilo. I don't daven with Kavana. The third one is I daven with Kavana and expect great results. That's what we're talking about in Argon. Further on. Amr Rabbi Yitzchak, the same Rabbi Yitzchak is, is going on and on and on. The sixth teaching, it's the sixth time he's speaking. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I skipped something. My mistake. Sorry, the middle of the same paragraph. The Amr Rabbi whoever submits judgment of his fellow to heaven, who then Ashkila, you be you're, you're punished first. That person might be punished too, but you'll get the punishment before that. Where do we see that? With Sarah and Avram. Sarah was saying to Avram, Atoma Sarah Avram Hamasi Alecha. Sorry tells Sarah tells Avram, My injustice is upon you. Let Hashem judge between me and you. So look at footnote here. It says that Sarah was angry at Avram Avinu for not taking up her, her case. What was her case? Hugger was laughing at her. You have no children. Now, Ram was quiet. Well, Sarah says, God will punish you for this. And she died first. She was supposed to live much longer. But because she said to Hashem, take care of Ram Avinu, her own husband. She said those words. She was punished and passed away many years before. So if Sarah was punished, you know, uh, for that, obviously anyone who does the same thing is also putting his life in danger. And it's written later on by Yahweh Avram Lispite Lasada Bulkaisa. And it's written afterwards that Avram came to eulogize Sarah. Right after Sarah said this, not long after Sarah passed away. Amar Rabbi Yitzchak, a sixth teaching. There are four things that cause the unfavorable decree against a person to be torn up. It could sometimes happen that a person sinned very terribly. Even if the person did tshuva, but why did you wait till the problems came around to do tshuva? The fact you waited and didn't do tshuva right away, you're in trouble. But there are four, besides the tshuva, there are four things you might need to do, one of the four, that will save you and break the evil decree. What are the four things? The elohain, staka, giving staka can save a person from death. Saka, crying, not just some of the gun, but Shouting and crying to Hashem with tears. That can do it. Thirdly, Shinu Hashem, change of name. Okay, change of name sounds strange. That's not that hard to change a name. Do I deserve to change my name? Goodbye. What does it mean changing a name? Yes. Yeah, having a name helps when a person is not suffering because of sin, but suffering an illness. But we know I'm adding a name. 
But here we're talking about you messed up. You, you sinned and you didn't do tshuva right away. You waited. So Shini Hashem doesn't seem to work. It shouldn't work, you were thinking. Isn't it like creating a different name for yourself? Okay, so it, yeah. So what it means is not just changing your name. It means changing your whole way of living. Uh, that people don't recognize you anymore. And it's connected to the next thing that Gemara says here. Machinery mice and change of action. Change of action doesn't mean you just don't do the wrong thing you did before. You become a different person. Both your name is people don't remember you anymore. You're a different, different name and a di different person. It's like I'm not the sinner. Look at my name, it's not the same. And my actions following my name are totally different. I'm not only not doing the same wrong things I did before, I'm doing mitzvahs like I never did before. I'm going out of my way do things that are not obligatory to do. Kedar mitzvah. All I have to do is just to chuba, repent from the past. I'm not, and I'm doing much more than that. I am going beyond the letter of the law and everything in my life. You can't even recognize me. That breaks through the decree because you're not the same person anymore. On this person, there was a decree. Not on, that, not on this new person that you are right now. So we have four things. Now, it's possible that we're talking about a person who didn't do chuba because the fact that he's suffering has nothing to do with his sins. Sometimes Sadiq can suffer because of a generation. There's a Gzar Din al a decree on a righteous person, not for his own wrongdoings. So that, obviously, these things can also affect the change when there's no sin involved. If it can affect the change when a person did sin, for sure it can affect the change in the Gzar Din after, if a person never sinned. Okay, how do we know these four things break the rules and can change your fate. Tzedakah, charity, for it is written, and charity will rescue from the death. How do we know crying works? Crying out, there's a pasta can kill him. It's in uh, chapter 107. They cried out to Hashem in their distress. They were going through hard times. They were suffering with being incarcerated. And from their distress and anguish, Yotzi'em. So Hashem will take you out of all kinds of problems by shouting and crying, screaming. Shini Hashem, where do we see Shini Hashem changes things? So here we see by Sarai Menu, Sarai Ishtacha, Laisikro, Ashma, Sarai, Ki, Sarashma. So here it's not a case of a person who sins. Sarah never sinned. We're talking about a person who is destined not to have children. And by changing her name, her name now is new, so she has a new mazel, and she was able to have real children. From Sarai to Sarah. I have blessed her, and I will give you a child from her with her. Where do we see that changing act, change of action affects a change in, in a decree? It's written in the story with Ninveh that we read on Yom Kippur. People, non-Jewish non people. The wicked of Nin, people of Ninveh did tshuva. And they changed their actions. Like they, they, they didn't just do tshuva, they became different people. And it says, God immediately thereafter relented concerning the evil he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Yes, Omrim, and there's some that say, also a change of place. If you change your location, that could also help. Going into a place, to a new place, is like exile. It says, by Avram Avinu, by Yerim Hashem al Avram, Lech Abraham is told by God to leave. And what happened afterwards? He was not destined to have children. And then afterwards, Hashem promises him, promises him with a great nation. For Hadar and afterwards, the Eschah, the God, God, I will make you into a great nation. So how come it wasn't mentioned amongst the four? Why is it only one opinion that says that you can count Shinai Mokram as one of the things that break Zero? How come the first opinion didn't mention those? He only mentioned Shinai Maisa. He mentioned changing a name, changing your actions, screaming, and giving Zaka. What about Shini Mokran? What about the proof of Abraham Avinu? He was destined not to have children. He left his location. Hashem promises. Now you can have children. So we see Shini Mokran. Changing your Mokran can change your mazel. The response is, you know why? It wasn't because he changed his place. Because it was Chus of Eretz Yisrael. He didn't just change his location. He went to Israel. He goes to Eretz Yisrael. Different story. But Stam changing a place from one place of Chutz Lord to another place of Chutz Lord might not be strong enough to revoke any kind of decree against you. The Edoch and the other one says, Hahu, 
that story is not a proof. That might of Ram Avinu serves no proof because it might have been the merit of living in Eretz Yisrael that helped Abraham, not the change of place per se. Okay, I want to give you one more. Uh, uh, story here, make copy of the story. The next page, we're skipping around a little bit. Pass this down. A very interesting story. Um, yeah, from the bottom of 16 of Fezayin. Uh, on the bottom of Yudzayin, page Yudzayin. Only one page. Um, yeah, 17A4 is the page. Look on the right side of the, of the page, on the close to the top. Gemara teaches another lesson derived from one of the previously cited verses. Okay, Omar Rava. Rava says, very important piece of Gemara here. Anyone who relinquishes his measures of retribution, someone really wronged you, you could very easily fight back and teach that guy a lesson, that personal lesson, and you don't. Somebody, why should I bother with this? I'm not perfect myself. I'll forgive that person. I need Hashem's forgiveness anyways for my, my misdoings. I'll forgive this person. Well, he's wrong. If you, it's called passing up on what you would love to do. Passing up opportunity to take revenge. Whoever does that, whoever does that through humility in a humble way, uh, it can be done in a non-humble way also. I should bother talking to this guy. Below my dignity to even try to respond to this person. No, if it's not below your dignity, you feel like you really want to say something and you don't. Why don't you? I'm not perfect myself. Whoever does that, the heavenly tribunal relinquishes all his sins for him. Listen to this. If you are able to relinquish one's own measures of what you think should happen to that person based on what that person did to you and you happen to be right, the heavenly tribunal will also act in kind and also relinquish all your sins, even though you might not deserve it. Shinamar, no say avon, he pardons transgression, but over al pesha. What does that mean, over al pesha? It means to whom does Hashem overlook transgression? No say means to carry, meaning to overlook. To whom? To the one who is over al pesha. The misha over al pesha, one who overlooks sin. Over means to pass by, to pass up. Pesha, sins committed against himself. And they might be very egregious sins, really tough ones. Real wicked people are really trying to hurt you and you don't respond. The reason why you don't respond is I'm far from perfect myself. Why should I respond? I need to think, worry about myself. I'm worried about other people. Well, that's Hashem's his business, it's not my business. When you do that, Hashem will take care of your business. So since you acted with Nimish Hadin, you went beyond the letter of the law, not to do things based on measure for measure. I will also act in time. Now, here's the story. Rav Huna, Rav Huna, the son of Rabbi Yeshua, Cholash, he became ill and very ill. He was on his deathbed. Oh, Rav Papa. Rav Papa went with a student to inquire about him, which was a Yuli Bain. Not really a student, actually, was like a, more of a contemporary, more of a chaber of his. And he went to uh, inquire about him, how he's doing. Rapapa Chazye de Chalish Le Alma. Rapapa saw and noticed he was on his brink of death. He was worse than he ever imagined. The world was weak. Chalish means like Chalash, weak. Alma, the world. He was about to leave this world. Omaluhu, Zvatita. He said to the people there, supply him, prepare all the, uh, you know, his, for his journey into the next world. Prepare the shroud, get ready for the burial. And he made a pretty loud statement. He's not going to last very long. With Saif, in the end, Rav Huna recovered miraculously. With Saif, Itpach, he was recovered. The Papa was very embarrassed. Because in front of Rav Huna, he said, the man is dying. Prepare his shrouds. 
and he recovers. So very uncomfortable. So he have a mix of Rapapa with Mechze. Rapapa was embarrassed to see him. Well, he didn't he didn't he didn't see him. So Omrule, they told Rav Huna, what did you see when you were in the, you know, you were not, you were obviously in the in the in Ghanaian probably when you were that state. What's the latest news? Omrule, my chazis, what did you see? Amrulahu in Hakihava. What did I see? I Itaka was dying. I was basically dead. And I came back. What happened? In Hachihava, it was Takaso. I was about to die, or about to die, very close to the brink of death. But Baruch Hu, at the last minute of the Holy One, the Abish himself said to the heavenly tribunal, who was on his way out, since he does not stand on his principle, he is tolerant of others who wrong him, do not take a strict stand against him. Shenemar nosi avon over al pesha. As it is the part of transgression, of course, we're not talking about real transgressions, we're talking about a, a tzaddik over here. But relative to his level, he felt there were transgressions and Hashem would have taken his life away. But Hashem forgave him because of the fact that he forgave that person. With me, no seavon, whose transgressions does, does he pardon? The over Pesha, one who passes by sins committed against him. Um, I wanted to say something. I what I wanted to say. Gemara concludes over here, the last few lines. Not everyone who forgives, who doesn't, you know, take retribution, gets this chus. Only if it comes through humility, not through arrogance. If the reason why you're not fighting back is because I don't deal with people like that, then that doesn't count. It counts only if you uh, leave out, just forget about taking, uh, forget about passing up opportunities because of humility. Who am I to go ahead and punish that person? Am I so perfect? Far from it. That's when you deserve it. How do we know that? Because right after it says, over al it says, simple meaning to the remnants of his inheritance. But it also has a deeper meaning. L'she'eris means to those people that consider themselves leftovers. If you're very humble, you consider yourself like, I'm just like a leftover. She'erit. Then you deserve Hashem to forgive you when you forgive other people so quickly. In other words, out of humility. I wanted to say something very important. I thought you forgot what it is. But all we forget. Um, maybe it'll come to me. But I do want to. But I do want to say, at least I didn't forget, is that on the day of a birthday, one has special powers. The mazel is go over. So therefore, I give every one of you a bracha from quite deep, from within, that all of you should have a tremendous amount of success in all your endeavors, sure the good ones. The gashmi is the should find in the very not too near near future your soulmate uh, and to be a good soulmate live a happy a happy very happy life in the very near future all of you should find what you're looking for and uh, you should really before before finding your soulmate have a tremendous amount of success while you're here in your learning in your Yerushalayim in your cities and everything that's good and have also a great impact on other people that are not yet with the program, with the Judaism program. Have a tremendous amount of success on getting all your friends that you knew before who are not yet from. And uh, the schus of, as the Rebbe always says, the people who have witnessed you know, in their past a lot of negativity, they didn't know, know any better and they uh, didn't eat kosher and they didn't keep Shabbos and all that. So the person, Asked the Rebbe, how do I correct my non kosher food many years? The Rebbe's answer was, since it wasn't your fault, getting other people to eat kosher will rectify everything. And that's true about, uh, the Rebbe always talked about a Seder. I'll put an empty chair to Seder. Empty chair in honor of a six million. They don't, they don't care about honoring them that way. The honor of a six million Jews, Hashoah, is by putting a chair and getting the chair seated by a person. Bring a person out there, bring the fifth child in. The fifth child doesn't come to the Seder, who not, never come to the Seder, get that person to come. Fill the room with people, don't put empty chairs there. That's such a, such a different way of looking at things from the rest of the world.
empty chair. I mean, oh, I feel so odd. You're thinking about us in that world, in Ghana, they're not thinking that way. They're not thinking, oh, you know, you, you still remember us? It's not how Nishamas think. What is, how do you pay a Nishama with mitzvahs that you do down here? They don't have that upstairs. They can't do, they can't do mitzvahs anymore upstairs. They can learn, but they can't do a mitzvah without a human body. They are thirsty for people doing mitzvahs in their behalf. That's what they're looking for. They laugh at people who cry for them and put empty chairs for them. They don't laugh, they're in pain. Oh, such foolish people, they don't get us. They don't, these human beings don't understand what we want now. And so anyways, we should, um, a great bunch, so this great bunch of special people. Anyway, you should have the, all the brachas that I gave and much, much more to be fulfilled. Amen. And I want you to report some good news. Amen. See if my brachas really, really <laughs> worked. Amen. Amen. I wanted to say something, I can't remember what it was, what was it, and you have some time. Hey, Rabbi, you're showing up to my wedding, <laughs> Okay, my session. Um, What did I want to say? Um, I think. Um, oh. Any questions? Have any questions? Any answers? Any statements? Any any remarks? Any comments? Any jokes? Yes. What is the most controversial Jewish reason? I have an answer. Mm -hmm. Robert Modesto gave me the answer of Chalent, which is a good answer. I'm going with what this is not the Chalent generation. I agree. This is not the it's a milk generation. No one needs to but maybe there are exceptions. Many, many of the young generation, not my, my own children, uh, love to eat milk on Shabbos. So they skip on the chon. Huh? On Shabbos? On Shabbos. Okay. Well, not, not, they don't have to milk a meal, they have power. And so that later on, they don't, have to, they don't have to wait six hours. God forbid to have to wait six hours. We can't have our 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 yogurt or our pizza. No, 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 no. Huh? Yeah. So I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. But meeting was wonderful. I hope that's anyone that deserves. When I was uh, my focus, I'll tell anyway. Since it's birthday. Our birthday, we go in, we go into the Rebbe one on one. Yechidis every year on your birthday, you go and have close to go into the Rebbe and get a bracha. It, there's no way to describe the feeling. It, it's beyond words. I wasn't nervous at all because to be nervous, you have to feel yourself. And when you're in the room, the presence of such a person, you don't feel yourself. You feel nervous before you walk in. Anyways, I told the story before, but I'll tell it again. Not everyone has heard it. I wrote into the Rebbe for the first time. At my bar mitzvah, I went out with my father. I was, you know, felt safer. And uh, the Rebbe gave me a bracha. He didn't test me. I felt very, very, you know, down that I was not tested. My older brother was tested on the mimer, on the pilpul for his bar mitzvah. What, is he gonna, what are you gonna talk about in your bar mitzvah? And my younger brother was tested. I was not tested. I was like down. I said, yeah, I'm not, I'm not worthy of being tested. My, my two brothers are very, very different. My younger brother is extremely different than my older brother. It's more on the chilled side. And in fact, the Rebbe asked him in Yiddish, do you prepare a pilpul? And the Rebbe is telling me, my, my father's telling the Rebbe, did you prepare a pilpul? Did you prepare a speech? Pilpul. A mimer, a drasha, and all Yiddish. My, my brother didn't react. A sermon? I said, you prepare a sermon, and he started using English. The younger brother didn't know, he didn't know Yiddish at that time. The older brother was a whole big lamb over there, you know. The Rebbe asked him questions, one after the other. He answered like that. And the Rebbe asked him, is the idea of having to accelerate in holiness a Torah principle or a rabbinical principle? My brother answered that, I didn't learn. The Rebbe goes to my father and asks my father, What's, what do you say? My father got tested. He wasn't expecting that. He never gets nervous. He, ne he never, ever gets nervous. It's like it's against his... 
He got nervous. He says, the Rebbe smiled and says, the Alter Rebbe also didn't know. <laughs> to me, I got nothing. Anyways, the next following year, when I was 14, my brother wrote for me. I went in myself. My brother wrote, wrote my older brother wrote for me a uh, pan. Whatever. When I was 15. I don't need my brother anymore. I could write my own. So, so I decided I'm going to write really long. I had a terrible handwriting. Yeah, so know. terrible that I, am, so, I myself couldn't read what I wrote. Neither can any human being in the world figure out what I wrote unless you have Ruha Kredit. <laughs> but the writing won't tell you anything. <laughs> Scribble. <laughs> and write. I wrote about a whole big side and another side of two sides, like a few hundred words, maybe a thousand words. And everything I had, everything I had in my mind, I wrote into the Rebbe. It's a dumb thing to do. Rebbe takes, here's my gentle. And not more than 10 seconds. That that you ask about this and this and this. And you read the whole thing. He didn't read it. He read he it was Rachel Kaidish. It's impossible for Rebbe to read it. I couldn't read it. And it was like that. As he's putting his head down, he's answering everything I wrote. That was Gilliolikos to me. The following year, I was told off by my brother, you idiot, why did you write so sloppy and why did you write so long? That was time is precious. Next year, I learned a lesson. I wrote Ani or Ginini, I, my name, my mother's name, my Yemel letters on this and this day, Carfellu, and I want a bracha. Three lines, and you can read it in less than five seconds. Big word, like a big hour. You wrote Nita? Huh? You wrote Nita? What's it? You wrote Juanita? Yes, I wrote slow, like, uh, like penmanship, you know, uh, bay, like that. And the Rebbe looked at it and looked at it, looked at it for about 40 seconds. He was looking at it, put on his glasses. That shows that Rebbe is not reading, he's reading your soul. The year before, my neshama was still intact. The next year, I messed up so badly. Rebbe was reading, oh, this guy really messed up. And he gave me a bracha. But that's, a, that's an experience I had during those two years. Um, when we were in Miami, that's one last story. And we'll, uh, it's this famous story. I told it over many times. I'll tell it again. In the very last few weeks of our tenure of three years in Miami Beach, Florida, we were the first looking to go to travel Bahrain, to build the yeshiva in Miami from New York. We were there for three years instead of two years. We added one year on our own. We asked the Rebbe to add a year. We thought we can accomplish more, and the Rebbe gave us permission. Um, at the end of very end, we got a little. I got a little restless with my friend. So uh, my name is Yosef. His name is David. I'm sure most of you have heard of it. All. Some of you haven't heard the story. I'll tell it over. And uh, we heard there's a graphologist, a, a woman who analyzes handwriting, analyzes your character through handwriting. We decided, let's see if she's really active, she knows what you're doing. So I wrote my name in English, and he wrote his name in English, and we gave it to her. And she was so accurate and scary. It was like unbelievable accurate. So, whoa, that's the case? Let's try with the Rebbe's. And those days, the Rebbe's signature was, the Rebbe's was not well known in the 70s. This was 1976. So we took a letter, cut out the whole letter, I would just grab his name and last name in English. I would sign his name in English. He gave it to her. She said, I don't have time right now. But please call me tomorrow. Well, she didn't wait for us to call her. She called us in the middle of the night. It was 11 p.m. It was a, a, a phone in the base on Medrash. And she said, is Joseph or David there? So someone answered, uh, Joseph's a lady. Wants to oh, I think I know who it is. I go to the phone. Hello, are you, who, are you Joseph or David? I'm Joseph. Who is this man? I said, he is the leader of world Jewry. He is the greatest leader of this generation and actually many generations before as well. Can you come to my office tomorrow morning? I came to the office the next morning. She said, sit down. I want to tell you something here. This person, whoever he is, he's off the chart from both ends. What do, you, what do I mean by that? There are people that are very, very optimistic about things that will be good. Everything is, you know, never giving up hope. He's off the chart 
in the never giving up hope. He never, never gives up, never says fa found. He didn't, say, he didn't say those words. He never ends in despair. The word despair is not in his dictionary. But yet, the other side of the spectrum, he never is happy with his accomplishments. You can never satisfy him off the chart in that. These are two opposites. If you're never satisfied, you can easily get depressed and easily give up. You have high expectations, inflated expectations of yourself. It's very easy to just to sign off. He's off the chart in both. Okay, that's not enough. She says he doesn't live on, on food. This is not a religious woman. An older Jewish woman, 60s, not religious. Uh, he does not live on food that he eats. That prevents him from dying. What he lives on is what his followers do or don't do. That's what gives him life. He lives by his followers. And his whole life is those that follow his trend of believing in God. In other words, what it says exactly in Tanya, that a tzaddik's life is emuna, yira, ava, not gashmius. This is a not religious woman saying this. How did you know? From the handwriting. Don't ask how, I don't know. And we were so astounded, we said, whoa. She said, I want to meet him. I said, well, that's going to be hard. But tomorrow night is going to be for him. So if you want, you can listen to him by a hookup. And she came, didn't understand a word, we translated it. Was translated for her, and she said his voice matches his handwriting. That's all she said. That's a story. My father gave me a lot of rebuke for how dare you take the Rebbe's signature, play with it. <laughs> I got rebuked for it. But anyways, anyways, have a wonderful Shabbos, and don't lose, don't lose the copies. Did you ever tell the Rebbe that you did it?